Hi, I'm Dan Wright. I'd like to welcome you to the first Dan Talk, Design Audio Narrative. The subject of today's talk is watts and ohms. I would like to talk about the relationship between watts and ohms and how these two things influence performance of both tube and solid state amps when driving different speakers of different impedances. How is power delivered? Do the same speakers need more power and how much is enough? Once we understand this relationship, we can get the best sound from our system. I also want to talk briefly about impedance as the ohms relate to matching preamp and amp impedance for best sound. This is a subject that is often misunderstood and not often discussed. First of all, the basics of watts and ohms or power and impedance. We're going to use the equation based on Ohm's law, voltage equals current times resistance or V equals IR. The other form of this equation related to power is P equals VI or voltage times current. It's also power equals voltage squared over resistance and also power equals current squared times resistance. This is important because power relates to both current and voltage and resistance uh, in different ways for tube and solid state amps. <clears throat> this is important because for a given voltage, a lower impedance speaker than an 8 ohm, say a 4 ohm or a 2 ohm speaker, will draw more current and demand more power than a higher impedance speaker, such as 8 ohms. The other important thing to note here is that solid state amps amplify current. Tube amps amplify voltage. Solid state amps are generally designed to provide more power as the speaker impedance decreases. For example, an amp that provides 100 watts into an 8 ohm load will in theory provide 200 watts into a 4 ohm load and 400 watts into a 2 ohm load. Conversely, a tube amp is primarily an impedance matching device. As I said, it amplifies voltage. A tube amp has, in most cases, has an output transformer. The purpose of this transformer is to match the amp to the speaker's impedance. Most tube amps will have multiple taps or secondary windings on this transformer, commonly 8 ohms, 4 ohms, and sometimes 2 ohms. The important thing here to note is that a 100 watt tube amp connected to an 8 ohm speaker via the 8 ohm tap will provide 100 watts of power. That same amp connected via a 4 ohm tap to a 4 ohm speaker will also provide 100 watts and the same 2 ohm speaker to the 2 ohm tap, again, 100 watts. Unlike solid state amps, tube amps handle power differently through voltage, not current. So why do we care? Um, there's no wrong answer. Uh, tube amps, solid state amps, they each have their, their following. I prefer solid state amplification. Uh, despite having designed tube and solid state amplifiers and found great sound with both. The reason I prefer solid state amplification is that I have more choice in terms of speakers. The, uh, the impedance and the efficiency of the speaker is not the limiting factor. Um, and I like this. I do like the sound of tubes and I achieve this in the line level um, equipment such as preamp and source. This is where I feel I'm able to achieve the sound of tubes, the body, the weight, the three dimensional uh, holographic sound and still have the current amplifying ability of the solid state amp to provide power as needed. And moving ahead with our system, hmm. watts and ohms are very important. Understanding them is key. When it comes to watts and amplifier design, we're also talking about current. Power is a function of voltage, current, and ohms. Generally speaking, speaking the voltage for an amp is fixed. <clears throat> but especially in terms of solid state amps, current is not. So how much power do you need? Honestly, 50 to 100 watts is plenty of power for the average speaker in most listening rooms, for most people's listening at loud enough levels. This is mainly because, quite frankly, the average speaker is drawing a handful of watts most of the time, maybe 20 watts at most on average. 
However, there are peak moments, moments in the music when the power peaks, a bass note, a crescendo of an orchestra. And at these times, the power required is as high as possible. Um, so we regard this as power capacity or power reserve of an amplifier, and I'll explain how and why this is important as we go on. Now, <clears throat> marketing specifications versus reality. Um, I find that a lot of marketing companies like to tout the peak power specification of an amplifier. Peak power is hard to define. It is the power delivered in an instant um, to the speaker, and it can be it can be quite high. The problem I have is it's very difficult to measure, um, and it's a term that's abused. Um, for instance, a 100 watt amp into eight ohms, 200 watts into four ohms. Um, they may say it's got peak power of a thousand watts. Well, if it's built around a 500 VA transformer, that's just not possible. So. Um, I like to speak in terms of measured power or max power with our amps, and I will continue in that vein as we go. <laughs> when I refer to an amplifier's total power capacity, I'm really talking about how much power the amp can take from the AC outlet and translate to usable power. A power transformer's overall size is defined by VA or volt amps, which equals watts. Again, Ohm's law, power equals voltage times current, or volt amps equals watts, okay? Now, a high current amp will have a big power transformer. How big depends on a few things, on budget, physical size, and the strength of your back. Do you want an amp that won't fit a standard rack that weighs 200 pounds, or do you want an amp that fits a standard rack, perhaps 17 inches wide by 17 inches deep max with a uh, reasonable height. Perhaps you'd like to be able to lift it, so 50 pounds is the max. At Moderate, I've designed a number of amplifiers, ranging from 8 watt up to 600 watt amps. The tube amps, of course, counting for the lower wattage types. The key to power rating as it translates to max power, is mostly defined by the power transformer capacity, or VA. You may find products that are said to deliver 150 watts into 8 ohms, with peak power of 1,000 watts. If you find that power transformer itself is 500 VA, as I said before, you know something's wrong. Transformer capacity, or VA, does give good indication of an amplifier's instantaneous power delivery. When I say instantaneous power delivery, I'm talking about the amp's ability to deliver a lot of power in a short period of time, in that brief instant. I'm not defining peak power. I don't like that term that I said earlier. An amplifier's weight is highly dependent upon the size of the power transformer. The second biggest contributor to the weight is the actual enclosure itself and heat sinks. Many higher-end amps are built out of billet aluminum and have big heat sinks to uh, get the heat out of the amplifier. This all adds to weight. Our stable of amplifiers over the years include, first, the KWA100SE. It's discontinued now, but it was our stereo amp rated for 100 watts into 8 ohms and 175 watts into 4 ohms. It weighed about 40 pounds and was built around a single 500 VA power transformer. The next amp in our lineup, which has been our reference amp for years, is the KWA150, later the KWA150SE stereo amp rated for 150 watts into 8 ohms and 275 watts into 4 ohms. Each 150 SE stereo amp weighed 85 pounds and included two 500 VA transformers. This is a big amp with a built aluminum closure and large heat sinks. The KWH225i integrated amp offers 225 watts into 8 ohms and 400 watts into 4 ohms. It weighs 65 pounds and uses a 1.5 kVA or 1500 VA power transformer. For up to 600 watts of power into, eight, into four ohms, pardon me, the 150 SE can be bridged in mono. The combined weight of two such mono amps is 170 pounds. Right now, we offer the KWA 99 mono blocks. These were designed with a number of things in mind, power, weight, 
space. It is 100 watts into 8 ohms and 200 watts into 4 ohms. These are monoblock amplifiers, each of which uses one 500 VA power transformer. Each amp weighs less than 40 pounds, and the dimensions are approximately 12 inches wide by 10 inches high by uh, probably 12 inches wide, 10 inches deep, and 5 inches high. Their intent is to be space, weight, um, and power efficient. Pardon me, not power efficient. Um, adequate power for efficient space and weight, if I meant to say. I am designing a new stereo amp right now, the KWA300. It will be 300 watts into 8 ohms, 500 watts into 4 ohms, and potentially a monoblock version of this could deliver over 900 watts into 8 ohms and 1,800 watts into 4 ohms. This amp will be heavy, well over 100 pounds, and will be designed around a 2,000 VA or 2 kVA power transformer. Anything can be done. I know of big amps that are rated at 2,100 watts into 8 ohms, 3,600 watts into 4 ohms, and 6,000 watts into 2 ohms. They're magnificent. They're designed with two 2,000 VA transformers per amp. Each weighs 200 pounds, and they cost over $110,000 per pair. We have lots of choices, and none of them are wrong. We have two different ways to provide the watts to satisfy the ohms of our system. Some prefer tube amps, others solid state. We don't have to be limited to one or the other. Hybrid amps use both tubes and solid state. It is important to look at an amplifier's rated power into the impedance of your speaker. If it is a tube amp, be sure that it has output taps that match your speaker's impedance, be they 8 ohm, 4 ohm, or even 2 ohm. And lastly, look at an amplifier's total capacity, total power capacity, pardon me. If the amp is rated for 100 watts at 8, 200 watts at 4, and 400 watts at 2 ohm, and the power transformer is only 300 VA, be suspicious. Something is not right. But how much is enough? <clears throat> As we know, in reality, more power is, well, more power. It really comes down to budget, space available, and logistics in terms of moving the equipment and weight. Now, the second part of my talk is impedance ohms as it relates to preamps and amplifiers. The other area where ohms are important is the impedance relationship between amp and preamp. Getting this wrong can lead to a loss in signal level and more commonly an overall degradation in sound quality. Impedance in this case is the resistance to the flow of music signal. Impedance ratio and why it's important. The impedance ratio that we're concerned with is the input impedance of the amplifier to the output impedance of the preamp. We want the amp to have a high input impedance and the preamp to have a low output impedance. Ideal impedance ratio. The ideal ratio of input impedance to output impedance is minimum 10 to 1, but ideally closer to 100 to 1. This means, for example, that a tube preamp with an output impedance of 1K would ideally be, be connected to an amplifier with an input impedance of 100K. Now, older tube amps tend to have higher output impedances like this, and they were commonly paired with tube amps, which have higher input impedances by design. Now, I like to use tube preamps with solid state amps. As a result, our own tube preamps are designed with lower output impedances in mind. Most of our, our preamps range from 100 to 500 ohms. Our amplifiers, in turn, range from about 20 to 100k ohm input impedance. For a solid state amp, impedance in the range of 10, 20, 50, or 100k are not uncommon. If we want to achieve that ideal 100 to 1 ratio, for instance, with a 10k ohm input impedance amplifier, we would want a preamp with an output impedance closer to 100 ohms. This can be done. Modern tube preamps such as ours do this and it works very well. So what does it sound like if the impedance match is not good? My personal experience in this regard is a general lack of body, weight, and drive. For example, in the early 2000s, passive preamps were a big thing. Step attenuators, very high quality volume controls, with no gain, no buffering, just straight attenuation. Now, the problem with this, say a 10K ohm uh, passive pre 
has essentially a 10k ohm output impedance. And so the amplifier input impedance sees a 10k ohm output impedance from the passive and, and the ratio is not good. Um, again, the result will be uh, detailed and clean but lacking drive, dynamics, and low frequency weight and punch. So what is going on? If the impedance match is not right, there can be frequency response distortion, low frequencies are attenuated, the result is a lack of body and impact. There's also phase shift and harmonic distortion that take place, all of which detract from ideal sonics. So bottom line, just make sure that your preamp or source feeding the amplifier has a low enough output impedance to maintain an ideal impedance ratio of 100 to 1 between amp input impedance and preamp output impedance. The analog bridge is an ideal product for going between solid state preamp and amp or solid state source and amp as it is an ideal impedance matching device. Analog bridge has a 100k input impedance and a 20 ohm output impedance. It is a tube product and as such does bring the quality of tubes to a solid state system that you want and also allows for the ideal impedance matching. It's a very popular product. We've been selling a lot of them lately. It operates on two different parallel tube circuits for different sound and it's tube rectified. So you can change any and all of these tubes to change the tonality of your system to suit your taste. So watts and ohms. <clears throat> In the end, if we get the watts and ohms right, we can enjoy our system. If the amp and speakers are a good match for our room and listening taste, music should flow effortlessly and not sound constrained at all. And if we have the right impedance ratio between amplifier and preamp, we also maintain impact, body, weight, and resolution to provide the very best sound. Thank you. Check our upcoming Dan Talks. Look for us on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram, and at www.modright.com. Thank you very much.